Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven, and as always, I'm very gratified by your choice to spend some of your time today listening to me talk about military history. Last time we looked at the earliest years of aviation in the U.S. Navy. Today we'll continue with this topic by examining in more detail some of the aircraft and weapons projects that the Navy was developing in the media pre-World War I years and in the wartime years. We'll also take a look at some of the operations that the new naval air arm was taking part in during the course of this gigantic conflict. My major source of information for this one will be the same publication I used for the last one, namely Naval Aviation in World War I by Adrian Van Wyen. This is a book that was published by the Office of the Chief of Naval Operations, and it consists of a series of articles from another Navy publication, the periodical Naval Aviation News. This volume is well edited and very information dense. I'll be supplementing the major source, as I usually do, with data drawn from various reference books, mostly the Rand McNally Encyclopedia of Military Aircraft by Enzo Angelucci. So, with that said, let's return to the early days of American involvement in World War I, and start by taking a look at the aircraft that the Navy was building to meet the goals of its wartime expansion effort. When the United States entered the First World War in April 1917, its aviation resources were minimal. The American aviation industry was small, and saddled with economic burdens such as exorbitant insurance costs and tremendously complicated overlapping patents that made the building of airplanes a very expensive and risky proposition. The new industry also faced the enormous obstacle of a very small market. The airline industry barely existed, and without airports it was unlikely to become very large. The military, at least in the United States, had procured only a handful of airplanes. Thus, in the country where heavier-than-air flight was invented, it remained essentially a novelty. The U.S. Navy's aviation branch was no more robust. It had only a few dozen low-performance aircraft, a few balloons, and a single airship which proved unsound on its second flight test. The training program, begun in 1916, had been suspended in the second half of that year due to similarly dangerous flaws that were revealed in the training planes being used. A few newer types of planes, namely the R-6 and N-9 biplanes, coming into service to address this problem. Both of these planes were built by the Curtis Company, a name that was virtually synonymous with naval aircraft at this early date. Both were small, one or two place aircraft powered by engines in the 150 horsepower range, which were also manufactured by Curtis. The N9 was intended for training, and was a float plane adaptation of the successful JN4 Jenny trainer, which was also used by the Army. The Jenny was slow and underpowered, handled very well and was very forgiving to an inexperienced pilot. The R-6 was another float plane, the latest in the R-series of general-use aircraft. The flight training program had barely begun to recover by April 1917, and as a result, very few trained pilots could be found in the Navy, to say nothing of other aviation specialists such as mechanics, inspectors, observers, engineers, or, of course, flight instructors. Very little in the way of infrastructure or facilities was available, and the Navy had but a single air station, which was then known as an aeronautical station, at Pensacola, Florida. The coming of the war meant that an enormous expansion program in all areas of American armament was needed. A remarkable job was done in the field of naval aviation in quite a short time. Much was accomplished with the assistance of institutions of higher learning such as MIT, where a comprehensive ground school was established to provide recruits with basic indoctrination and schooling and flying-related subjects. Some men were sent abroad for training with the Allies, including a contingent sent to Toronto to train with the Royal Flying Corps, and another group of Navy men, designated the 1st Aeronautical Detachment, that were sent untrained and unequipped to learn at French military flight schools using French aircraft. These men were some of the very first Americans to arrive in Europe after war was declared, and after completing their training, they would fly their first missions from French air stations. Private enterprise would also be called upon to assist in the training of the first crop of naval aviators. Manufacturers, such as Curtis, in many cases operated their own training facilities. These instructors, some of the only flight instructors in the country, were tasked with the qualification of the first sets of volunteers. For the purposes of lighter-than-air training, no facilities or personnel existed in the Navy at all, and arrangements were made with the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company to set up and operate a training school for these craft at the company's facility in Akron, Ohio. A series of Navy air bases, known as Naval Air Stations, were set up along the east coast of the United States. Some of these fields were taken over from private owners, from the Coast Guard, or from the naval militias of the seaboard states. Before a year was out, a string of bases from New England to Key West was coming into operation, 
equipped to support seaplane and lighter-than-air operations. As these became established, training functions as well as design and development work and weapons testing were transferred from the colleges and other temporary facilities and carried out at the stations. Eventually, the line would be expended into Canada, and bases in San Diego and in the Panama Canal Zone would also be set up. In Europe, the Americans would initially fly from the Allied air stations in France, the UK, Ireland, and Italy using Allied seaplanes and lighter than aircraft. As more trained Americans and their equipment reached the theater in 1918, many of these would be taken over and run by the Americans themselves. The relatively low production capacity of the U.S. aircraft industry led to the decision being taken by Navy leadership to set up a factory of their own to produce the seaplanes needed for the expansion program. This was built at the Philadelphia Navy Yard in late 1917, and by the end of the year, twin-engine Curtis H-16 seaplanes were coming out of its assembly bays. In addition to the production of these operational aircraft, Naval Aircraft Factory did important work on the development of prototype experimental planes, trained enlisted personnel in the assembly and maintenance of the airplanes that were built there, and performed repairs on badly damaged naval aircraft. The factory, though it was small by modern standards, built almost 200 planes for the Navy squadrons in the year of its wartime operation, and it would continue to operate through much of the interwar period. So with this general background in mind, let's take a look at some of the more important types of aircraft that the Navy was using in these years. In the years immediately before the American entry into the war, experiments were conducted in using catapults to launch aircraft from warships. The first American ship fitted with such a device, USS North Carolina, which was an armored cruiser, made the first successful launch using a Curtis AB-3 flying boat on July 14, 1916. Two other ships would be fitted with aircraft catapults before the beginning of the war. These were the cruisers Huntington and Seattle. However, Shipboard aviation would not be vigorously pursued by the United States in this period. Instead, the Navy would concentrate on the development of flying boats and seaplanes for patrol duties. The stance was indicated early in the war by the removal of the catapult gear and aviation detachment from the cruiser Seattle when she was readied for convoy duty in the days immediately following the declaration of war. The planes and flyers were left behind, and thus the Seattle missed the distinction of being the first American ship to operate combat planes in wartime. The main American patrol aircraft in 1917 was the Curtis H-Class flying boat. These large, long-range seaplanes were developed from a pre-World War I design intended to compete for a substantial prize offered for the first aircraft with a transatlantic range. In the days before airports, the long-range aircraft meant a seaplane. The Curtis Company created a large biplane flying boat powered by two engines mounted midway between the upper and lower wings. The early H-Series already had the very wide wingspan that would characterize this type. Two were made to attempt the prize flight in 1914, but the war obviously cancelled the contest. Planes were in England in preparation for the flight, and they were bought by the English, who wanted to use them as patrol planes. They proved very successful in this role, and the type was put into regular service by the Royal Navy. In British service, the H-Series flying boats were called Americas. Hundreds were made for the British. Several marks of H-Series flying boats were made, differing little in configuration or handling. The main difference is that they become progressively larger and are fitted with more powerful engines. The final major model, the H-16, would be the one put into service by the Americans as they became active in war operations. This is a large biplane with four bay wings, spanning 92 feet or about 28 meters, and carrying four men. It was slow, like all aircraft in this period, topping out at just 85 miles per hour or about 140 kph. This is relatively unimportant in a maritime patrol aircraft or what was wanted was the ability to remain on station for long periods. This the H-Series could do, having an endurance aloft of more than five hours. It carried a three or four man crew and was armed with as many as four 30 caliber Lewis machine guns, and had a bomb load of about 500 pounds. In British service, the H-16 was powered by Rolls-Royce Eagle engines and known as Large Americas. H-16s flying for the US Navy would be powered by 400 horsepower Liberty engines. These flying boats would eventually equip the squadron serving at overseas stations. A more numerous flying boat found in Navy service was the HS series. These were also a Curtis design, and were in fact a direct offshoot of the H series project. One of these, the H-14, was produced with two 100 horsepower Curtis engines intended to fill an army requirement. This project was not proceeded with, and the design was reworked into a single engine plane. This proved to be successful, with utility very close to that of the H-Series, but considerably cheaper to build and maintain. 
The HS differed from the H series primarily in their smaller size and a somewhat shorter endurance aloft. Smaller aircraft also carried a smaller armament, consisting of a single Lewis gun and a pair of 230-pound or 100-kilogram bombs. Several marks of HSs were produced. The base model was the HS-1, which was designed to use the Curtis VXX engine. Most Navy planes were built with the Liberty engine instead, and these were designated HS-1Ls. The HS-1s were found to have difficulty taking off carrying a full load of some of the larger anti-submarine bombs that came into use in 1918. The lifting capacity of the design was increased by lengthening the wingspan by about 6 feet, or 2 meters. These extended span HS boats were designated HS-2. Like the HS-1, it was originally designed to take a Curtis engine, but most Navy planes were built with the Liberty engine, and these were designated HS-2L. Hundreds of HS Series C planes were made, and these served a patrol function similar to that of their larger H Series counterparts. While the H Series were sent overseas, however, the HS series were used only in the Western Hemisphere, equipping Allied air stations from Nova Scotia to the Panama Canal Zone. In mid-1918, another flying boat was chosen to replace the H-16 in production at the Naval Aircraft Factory. This was a derivative of the same design lineage, called the F-5L. The original of this design, the Felix Stowe F-5, was the last in a line of successful flying boats designed by the Englishman John Cyril Port at the Seaplane Experimental Station in Felix Stowe, England. The F-Series flying boats were themselves a reworking of the Curtis H-12 and proved to be a much more suitable plane for the patrol role. Several squadrons of F-Series aircraft served with the British forces. An F-5 model was revised by improving the streamlining, fitting new mounts to take the Liberty engine, and replacing the dope linen fabric covering of the hull with wood veneer. The modified F-5 was built and tested in England, and once shown to be satisfactory, the design was provided to the U.S. Navy which reworked it for mass production techniques and put it into production at the Naval Aircraft Factory. The F-5L was slightly larger than the H-16, with marginally increased performance and load carrying ability. Its endurance aloft, however, was considerably greater. Like the H-16, the F-5L was armed with two to five Lewis machine guns. It carried a slightly heavier bomb load of a little bit more than 500 pounds. F-5Ls entered service with the Navy in the closing days of the war. A total of 227 were produced, 137 by the Navy at the Naval Aircraft Factory, 60 by Curtis, and another 30 by Canadian Aeroplanes Limited. This flying boat would remain the standard Navy patrol plane until 1928, when it would be replaced by similar aircraft of the PN series. Some would be converted for civilian use by Aeromarine Plane and Motor Company. These 10 passenger planes were known as Aeromarine 75s. Some were used for that company's airline on the run between Key West and Havana. Others would carry the first international air mail for the U.S. Post Office. The Navy also used a few types of airships during the war years. These were used in roles similar to those of the seaplanes, namely convoy protection, search and rescue, and overwater surveillance. They had a number of advantages over their heavier-than-air counterparts in this job. One, they had a far longer endurance aloft, often 20 hours or more, enabling them to stay on station for a much longer time. The relative lack of speed of the airship was little disadvantage in this work. Indeed, their ability to fly very slowly or hover often allowed them to spot inconspicuous objects such as mines, periscope wakes, or downed aviators that were much harder to notice from the faster moving platform. Typical of the Navy airships were the B-class blimps. These were three-man non-rigid airships. The gondola slung beneath the gas bag was a modified Curtis JN Jenny fuselage, complete with the OX series engine in the nose. Steering was accomplished by flight surfaces on fins at the rear. Air-filled gas bags in the main envelope could also be pumped full or evacuated of air to lower or raise the nose. This was done by a dedicated blower motor on the early machines, or by a device situated so as to pick up the prop wash from the engine on later ones. Armed versions would carry one or two machine guns and a few small bombs. The Navy also used a variety of French and British airships that were handed over by the Allies to the Americans before their own could reach the theater. These were of several kinds, usually only one or two of any specific type. Lighter than air branch of the U.S. Naval Aviation also operated kite balloons in a similar surveillance capacity. These were sent aloft from ships and towed along with a convoy, offering a spotting platform at altitude to detect approaching enemies. These were operated out of air stations along the coasts of Europe and America, with the balloons often being inflated at the station and then taken out to the convoy by a motor vessel, which would then pass them on to an escort vessel or a merchantman for towing. These were usually two-man balloons, 
although in practice they were often flown by just one man. During the course of the war, a variety of weapons would be used to arm naval planes. The first synchronized machine gun on a Navy seaplane was tested on the 5th of May, 1917. Tests were conducted using an R-5 float plane. Firing was done with the plane stationary on the beach or while taxiing on the water. On the 17th, the Navy ordered the first batch of weapons for the new planes to be built, a total of 100 machine guns, 50 fitted with synchronizer gear, and 50 ready for flexible mountings. Many more would follow, serving aboard both seaplanes and airships. Most of the machine guns would be Lewis guns. These famous British weapons were produced in enormous numbers in the first decades of the 20th century, and ended up in the hands of most of the armies of the world in one time or another. It was a light, reliable weapon, firing rifle caliber ammunition of various different calibers. American Lewis guns used either a 303 round of British pattern or a 30 6 Springfield cartridge. The gun was fed from a distinctive round shallow pan magazine at the top of the weapon, which could hold either 47 or 97 rounds. It was air-cooled and could be fired at a practical rate of about 500 rounds per minute. It was sometimes fitted with an aluminum cooling jacket covering the barrel, which can give it the appearance of a larger caliber weapon. The jacket was often removed from weapons used on aircraft, its exposure to the moving airstream made its cooling effect unnecessary. The Lewis was dangerous out to 3,000 yards, but its accuracy dropped off after more than 900. Automatic cannon of the kind used in later combat aircraft were not used on any American naval aircraft at this time. Heavy guns were not entirely absent from the Navy's aerial armory, however. One of the first practical recoilless rifles, the Davis gun, was procured for experimental purposes in 1917. This was a two-inch rifle with two barrels projecting from a common firing chamber, one pointing forward and the other rearward. A six-pound projectile would be placed in the forward barrel and a countered projectile consisting of grease and birdshot would be loaded into the rearward barrel. When fired, both would be launched out of their barrels in opposite directions, resulting in zero recoil. Later models would be refined by the omission of the countershot and rearward barrel, with the projectile casing itself being ejected rearwards to negate the recoil effect. This weapon was intended by the Navy for use in patrol aircraft against submarines and surface craft. The seaplane, known as the N-1, was designed to carry the Davis gun and a pair of prototypes were produced at the Naval Aircraft Factory. The long barrel gun was placed on a gimbal mount in an open cockpit at the front of the plane. The first N-1 was ready for test firing on May 1918, but was lost in an accidental fire before the program could begin. The second took off from the Delaware River on July 27th to test the gun, which was successfully fired at targets on the water. British experience with this weapon the previous year had been disappointing, however, and they had withdrawn their Davis-equipped Handley Page aircraft from service. The American project was not proceeded with and was dropped at the end of hostilities. Only five of the more than 2,200 N1s ordered were eventually produced. Aircraft delivered bombs at this time were little more than artillery shells mounted with fins to stabilize them in a predictable ballistic arc. These were small compared to what would come later, with 500 pounders being about the heaviest in use. The meager lifting capacity of the airplanes at the time made anything larger very problematic. Bomb aiming devices were embryonic where they were present at all. It was not unusual at this time for smaller bombs to be tossed by hand out of the cockpit and aiming entirely by eye. In naval service, some bombs were fitted with hydrostatic fuses like those used on depth charges. These are not entirely reliable, and many anti-submarine attacks were conducted using normal bombs with contact or time fuses. The torpedo as an air-delivered weapon was not used by the Americans in the First World War. Tests were conducted using airdrop torpedoes in August 1917 at Huntington Bay, Long Island, but these were not promising. The basic problem was the limited lifting capacity of Navy aircraft of the day in the face of the large size and weight of any torpedo capable of damaging a major warship. After the war, R-6 seaplanes fitted with new Liberty engines were modified and lifted a 400-pound test torpedo in an experimental program, but even this was much too small of a weapon to seriously endanger any class of warship larger than a destroyer. The air-delivered torpedo would not become a practical weapon in the American Navy until well into the 1920s. Perhaps the most ambitious weapons development program undertaken by the Navy during the war years involved pilotless aircraft. Not only was the Navy experimenting with drones at this early date, but it was in fact developing two different types of unmanned aircraft. One project involved radio-controlled airplanes, and the other aimed at producing aircraft that flew under totally automatic control. These latter would be developed into missiles that would take off, or be launched by a catapult, fly a preset course, and then dive into the ground. 
This project thus sought to achieve the creation of what was essentially a V-1-type flying bomb or a crude cruise missile with 1910s technology. A remarkable degree of progress was achieved with these weapons in the wartime years. The man behind the Navy's unmanned aircraft program was the inventor Elmer Sperry. This man was a versatile mechanical engineer who had made contributions to the state of the art in many areas of specialized machinery. In particular, he was a pioneer in the practical applications of gyroscopics, and this is what led him to the unpiloted aircraft project. His gyroscopic systems included two successful projects that would be instrumental to the creation of these kinds of drones, the gyro compass and gyroscopic stabilization systems for gun laying on naval warships. As early as 1913, Sperry was developing a gyroscopic stabilizer, a primitive form of autopilot, for use aboard aircraft. He succeeded in attracting Navy interest to this project, and they provided a flying boat as a testbed for Sperry's device. His son Lawrence, who would collaborate closely with his father on their Navy work, conducted the trials of the new autopilot. This device worked, though it proved less capable than they had hoped. Still, it was useful enough that it was put into production by the French. This experience convinced Lawrence Sperry of the huge potential of gyroscopics in aviation. He managed to communicate his enthusiasm to the Navy, who awarded the Sperry's contracts to develop devices such as gyroscopic bomb sites and flight instruments for aircraft, including the first blind flying instruments, such as rudimentary turn and bank indicators. In 1916, with American involvement in the European war seeming every day to be more likely, the father and son firm already had five years experience in gyroscopics, and a successful record of application of this then cutting-edge technology to military purposes. For the unmanned aircraft project, Sperry teamed up with Peter Cooper Hewitt, a pioneer in radio and electrical engineering. Both Hewitt and Sperry were members of several of the various boards and committees set up in the immediate pre-war years to advise on military technology projects for the Navy and War Departments. These connections helped them out tremendously in gaining backing and funding for their project. By the summer of 1916, they had a detailed design ready for the inspection of the Bureau of Ordnance. The Sperry Hewitt Aerial Torpedo, as it was called, would be a small pilotless seaplane propelled by a conventional aero engine. It was kept in flying trim and on course by gyro stabilizers and a gyro compass as well as a device that measured the distance flown. Its altitude was controlled by a device using an aneroid barometer, and the flight control surfaces were actuated by means of electric servo motors. The drone would be launched from a catapult, or set to take off in the conventional manner from the water, after which these control devices would activate, fly the aircraft along a pre-programmed course over a preset distance, at which point it could be made to drop a payload or dive kamikaze style into the target. This kind of crude cruise missile would have little accuracy, be useless against a moving target, but it could carry a useful payload out to a range of 50 to 100 miles. An aerial torpedo, even of modest size, could carry a larger payload than a regular underwater torpedo. Some naval men saw the potential of such a weapon, which one described as the, quote, gun of the future. One potential scenario was described in which a fleet of ships carrying these weapons could position itself a few dozen miles off to sea from a major U-boat installation on the Belgian and North German coast, and devastate it with volumes of missiles with little risk to themselves. Little biplane missiles could be launched at night, set to approach the target from a variety of directions, striking unexpectedly and with devastating effect. When war was declared, a consulting board reviewing wartime expansion needs recommended that $50,000 be budgeted for the development of the aerial torpedo, both the automatic and the remotely controlled models. By May 17, 1917, it was settled. The Navy would provide the Sperrys with a small number of N9 seaplanes and buy six sets of control gear. Grounds, hangars, and staff for the test program would be provided by the Sperrys. A budget of $200,000 was eventually approved, and the project was to be jointly carried out by three Navy bureaus, those of Ordnance, Engineering, and Construction and Repair. While the facilities and aircraft were being procured, Sperry engaged an engineer from Western Electric to help develop the control equipment for radio-controlled flight, and a workable set was created within a short time. The Sperry project would be terminated before the radio control gear was used in these drone aircraft. However, the system was put to use by the Navy in early guided bomb experiments. These involved a bomb that would trail a black parachute. The parachute had a large aluminum arrow, rigged to point in the direction that the bomb was moving, and by this indicator, an operator could use the radio control gear to alter the bomb's trajectory. Tests were conducted using the system at a range of four miles. Sperry, meanwhile, obtained a field on Long Island and was given a total of seven Navy seaplanes. 
Hangars and other installations were built, and the facility assigned a guard detail of Marines to ensure security. Test flights began that fall. On these initial flights, the planes were fitted with control gear for unmanned flight would be taken into air by a pilot, who would then turn the controls over to the autopilot, which would then attempt to fly the plane to a target and drop a bag of sand onto it. By mid-November, flights of up to 30 miles are being undertaken. The anticipation of the poor accuracy for these early attempts proved realistic, as the bags were often dropped up to two miles from the target. Nevertheless, the Navy was impressed enough with the potential of the project that had continued the development. Chief of Naval Operations directed that the project be continued up to the point that the aerial torpedo would be ready for production. No actual production resources would be allocated to the project before that time, and a determination of numbers to be made would wait until the prototypes had been demonstrated as reliable. This lack of production resources dedicated to the project would lead to difficulties in finding airframes for tests. Testing continued with the N9s. Problems with the launching method, aerodynamics, and control mechanism were the primary obstacles to the success of this program. Still, the tests were promising enough. An observer from the Army, Major General George Squire, was invited to watch part of the test flight program in the hopes of arousing interest in a similar program for the sister service. The general was favorably impressed, and Sperry would in fact work on similar machines for the Army, but not until after the war. The progress noted in the early stages of the program led to a revision of the previous policy of restricting its access to production resources. An exception to this policy was made in order to expedite the program, allowing a rush order to be placed with Curtis for six small purpose-built aircraft to be fitted with Sperry's automatic control gear. These tiny biplanes had an empty weight of just 500 pounds, and were capable of carrying a half-ton payload out to a distance of 50 miles at a speed of 90 miles per hour. The first of these Curtis flying bombs were delivered on November 10th. It was completely untested, having never been subjected to wind tunnel tests or flown by a pilot. Problems with the flying bomb's aerodynamics were soon discovered. This led to problems with the launching of the aircraft. Rather than risk destroying the airframe with an unpiloted launch, Lawrence Berry had the prototype fitted with simple controls and volunteered to take it up himself. The flight surfaces were tested while taxiing, and Sperry felt confident enough that he could take the new plane up on a test flight. On the takeoff run, however, the plane hit a patch of wet snow and went out of control, turning over and cartwheeling. Sperry, luckily, walked away unharmed, but the prototype was totally destroyed. Nothing daunted, when the next flying bomb arrived, he used this for his test flight, which proved successful under piloted control. Faults were detected with the automatic control gear, however, as these rolled the plane over when switched on. Problems with the aircraft's stability in flight were also uncovered. These were the kinds of things that needed to be investigated with wind tunnel tests, but no such facility was available for the use of the Sperry project, so they hit upon an unconventional solution. The prototype was mounted on a stand that was bolted onto an automobile. The combination was then driven at high speed down the Long Island Motor Parkway. Given that the car could get very close to the aircraft's operating speed, these pseudo-wind tunnel tests were able to identify the aerodynamic flaws that resulted in the instability. Adjustments were made to the airframe, and two more test flights attempts were made. The second of these was successful. However, the problematic nature of the Curtis flying bomb prototypes led to the decision to continue the development project using the N9. Wind tunnel tests would later refine the original unpiloted Curtis design, but these would not come until the end of the war. The problem of launching pilotless planes was a difficult one in its own right. The first attempts were performed by sliding the aircraft down a steel cable. The first launch attempt using the cable method damaged the aircraft's wing, while the second resulted in a successful takeoff, after which the airplane immediately dived into the ground. The wire launcher was abandoned after these failures, and a more conventional aircraft catapult was used. This had a 150-foot track, and its power was obtained by dropping a 3-ton weight from a height of 30 feet. First launches were unsuccessful, but within a month the process had been refined and aircraft were being reliable launched this way. The initial drones proved responsive to the automatic controls, but they were tail heavy and had a tendency to stall. The first really successful unpiloted flight was launched from the top of the test automobile. After separation, the airplane climbed and flew a preset distance of 1,000 yards, after which it descended and landed on the water offshore. For the next test, it was decided to launch the aircraft from the automobile again but a more stable platform was provided by fitting railroad wheels to the car and running it down an unused spur line of the Long Island Railroad. This proved to be a mistake, however. As the car built up to flight speed, the still-attached aircraft imparted enough lift to the car to disengage it from the rails, causing it to hop off the track and crash. A few more flights were attempted with the Curtis prototypes, 
but these resulted only in short flights that ended in crashes. Faults were identified in the control mechanism, and Sperry would make one more test flight with the corrected gear on October 17, 1918. This was flown in an N-9 seaplane, which by now had returned as the testbed aircraft for the program. This was launched from a new catapult using a flywheel that imparted a constant acceleration to the aircraft. The N-9 catapulted from this cleanly and climbed out in a perfectly straight course just two degrees off from that which had been set. The gear was set to bring the plane back down after a distance of eight miles, but the distance measuring device malfunctioned and the drone aircraft continued on course to the east. It was last seen over Bayshore Air Station at a height of 4,000 feet, still on course and heading east out to sea. This partially successful flight would be the last launch of the program before the end of the war, and the last conducted by the Sperrys. After the war, the program would be continued, but under Navy control. The post-war program would focus less on automatic flight than on radio-controlled operation. These tests would be carried out in the early 20s at the Anacostia Naval Air Station, which would later become the Naval Research Laboratory. This effort resulted in successful trials of the radio gear and aircraft, but interest in the project waned, and the program was abandoned in 1925. Similar experiments using Sperry messenger biplanes would be carried out by the Army in 1922. These were remarkably successful, and the radio-controlled planes scored simulated hits on targets at ranges of up to 90 miles. Communications was another rapidly progressing field of military technology. Not all those serving in a communications capacity aboard the Navy planes were human beings. In the days before the radio, carrier pigeons were widely used by the militaries of all nations to convey messages at a distance. They could also be used to send an SOS. Messages could easily be sent even from airborne aircraft. Crewmen would write the message to be sent on a slip of paper, which was then rolled up and inserted into a carrier attached to the leg of one of the trusty birds, which would then be tossed out of the plane to make its way back home to its station. The British refined this practice by putting the birds in an open bag before throwing them overboard to minimize damage to their feathers by the fast-moving airstream. At first, the Americans in France used birds of French, English, or Belgian origin that were provided for them, but as time went on, American-bred birds took over for most American purposes. During the course of the war, 12 American Navy pigeon stations would be set up in France. A total of 829 pigeons flew from them. They took part in 10,995 missions. During the course of these, they were entrusted with the delivery of 230 messages, 219 of which were delivered successfully, the remaining 11 birds missing in action. They saved the lives of several Navy aviators, who used the birds to communicate the locations of their planes brought down at sea. One of the first American seaplane crews to operate from France were saved by the birds in this way on, in April 1918, when the engine of their damaged Tellier seaplane failed while out on anti-submarine patrol. The day of the military pigeon was coming to an end, however. Radio communications between aircraft and ground stations was making rapid progress in Navy practice. Already on the 15th of May, 1917, experimenters at the Bureau of Steam Engineering reported success in receiving air-to-ground voice transmissions at a range of 50 nautical miles. Morse transmission using a device like a telegraph key was proved to be practical at an even longer range of 120 nautical miles. These experiments were carried out using the Marconi SE-1100 set, which had been specifically designed for use in the H-16 flying boat. Four days later, a series of practical trials were begun at the Pensacola Air Station. On September 7th, a radio-equipped seaplane took off from there and transmitted signals which were picked up at the Naval Air Station in New Orleans over a distance of 140 miles. Airborne radio would become widespread as the production and refinement of the equipment intensified in the coming months. The new technology would not, however, completely replace the veteran pigeons in naval service before hostilities ended, and many of these loyal birds would come back home with the victorious troops. Having surveyed some of the aircraft and development projects the Navy was working on in this period, let's take a look at some of its operations in the First World War. Although Navy planes had participated in the intervention of American forces in Mexico near Veracruz in 1914, nothing that could be called regular combat operations had been undertaken before the Great War. As was the case with the rest of the U.S. Navy during this conflict, the main emphasis on naval aviation was the protection of convoys. In practice, this meant scouting and anti-submarine warfare. An exception to this can be found in the operations of the Naval Air Station at Porto Corsini on the Adriatic coast of Italy. Here, just a short distance across the narrow sea from the major Austrian naval base at Pola, patrol activity would take a backseat to bombing raids on the Austrians in air-to-air -air battles with their fighters. The first naval aviator to receive the Medal of Honor, Hayes Hammond, won this distinction while flying on the Adriatic Station, 
when he pulled off a daring rescue of another Navy pilot whose Maki seaplane had been forced into the water by Austrian fighters. The great majority of Navy air operations, however, would consist of long patrols out over the oceans in search of enemy submarines. American anti-submarine patrols would take place almost entirely in the North Atlantic, either from bases in the U.S. East Coast or from stations in the U.K. and in Ireland. More than 20,000 patrol missions would be flown, covering a combined sea area of more than 800,000 square miles. Over the course of the war, American flyers would make 30 attacks on enemy submarines. The effect of these patrols is out of proportion to the numbers of actual attacks, as the presence of patrolling aircraft not only deterred many submarines, but the planes also directed surface escorts to U-boats and thus assisted in many more victories over the undersea raiders. We mentioned that the first American flyers were sent to France before the first American aircraft. This meant that these early waves of French-trained pilots conducted the initial patrol operations in French aircraft. Normal operational routine for overwater patrol involved assigning sectors to each air station. These sectors themselves would then be divided into squares 25 nautical miles on a side. These squares would be further divided into 5 mile squares, and this coordinate system would allow positions to be rapidly communicated. Communications with shore were conducted by a radio or carrier pigeon, and that was ships by means of very pistols, message boys, phosphorus boys, and blinker lights. When on convoy escort duty, the normal practice was for a pair of seaplanes to accompany the convoy through the sector. One would remain in the vicinity of the ships, while the other scouted out 10 to 15 nautical miles ahead of the ships in a broad zigzag pattern. Usually, the sector would be too wide for a single pair of planes to remain with the convoy during its passage, so a second pair would relieve the first near the midway point. An alert section of planes would also be held in readiness at the station, ready to respond to emergency calls. This emergency call response, which includes search and rescue missions as well as search and destroy, was an important part of the seaplane's function. The first instance of U.S. Navy planes attacking a U-boat from French bases came on April 23, 1918, carried out by a pair of French-made Donne de Nova seaplanes commanded by Ensigns K.R. Smith and R.H. Harrell out of the Naval Air Station at Ile 2D. The sector served by this station saw two coastal convoys pass by each day in opposite directions. Along their course, near Penmosh Point, lay a patch of deep water without shoals or sandbars, an ideal spot for submarine ambush. A pair of seaplanes in this area this morning, escorting a southbound convoy of 20 ships. The day was breaking with fog on the water, and the planes were sweeping to the rear of the convoy to find stragglers and direct them back to the main body. As the fog broke up, they turned back to rejoin the convoy, swinging around in a wide arc towards the south. Here they spotted a wake in the water, like that made by a submarine traveling at high speed on the surface. Smith closed in and made his attack run first, dropping two bombs. One of these fell in the wake and one just in front of it, causing a big disturbance in the water and what looked like large air bubbles coming to the surface. The initial bombing run seemed so successful that the second plane did not drop its bombs. Instead, it dropped a phosphorus marker buoy and circled the spot. The first plane then flew back to the convoy and found an American destroyer, the USS Stewart, and dropped a message buoy close to it with a report and the location of the suspected U-boat. Stewart, accompanied by the French gunboat Ardent, hurried to the scene and dropped death charges. The patrol pilots, still circling overhead, reported seeing debris and oil come to the surface, then headed back to base. Ensign Smith and his observer, Chief O.E. Williams, were credited with a kill by the French naval authorities, commended in the order of the day, and awarded the Croix de Guerre with a palm. Later that year, another ensign, J.J. Shefflin, this time flying an English seaplane out of the Royal Navy Air Station at Killingholm on the British North Sea coast, bombed a U-boat and scored a near miss. The sub crash-dived, but apparently was damaged by the explosions as it soon came back to the surface. It was sunk by gunfire from British destroyers shortly after. Ten days later, Shefflin was off Flamblory Head when he hit a pocket of strong turbulence that damaged one of his bomb release mechanisms, leaving the bomb dangerously suspended, forcing him to jettison it. Left with one bomb, he came upon another surface sub and went into the attack. He landed his bomb directly beneath the vessel's stern, blasting the back half of the submarine entirely out of the water so that he could see the rotating screws, sending it diving away at a steep angle. Later that day, a submarine, it was probably the same one, was found traveling at low speed on the surface there by destroyer HMS Gary, and sent it down for good with a classic ramming attack. These two attacks show how the team of surface escort and patrol bomber could work together to enhance the lethality of both. Submarines would usually attempt to get underwater as fast as possible when they notice an allied aircraft. Some chose to fight it out on the surface with their anti-aircraft armament. 
An American fell in with one of the more aggressive sub-captains on the 13th of August, 1918, off the coast of northern France. Four seaplanes flying in from the air station at Dunkirk found a submarine running on high speed on the surface and making no attempt at evasion. The planes went in to investigate and fired flares as a challenge. The submarine responded with shells from its 4-inch deck gun. One of the planes, piloted by Ensign J.F. Carson, was singled out by the gunner, who let fly five of the big shells at the plane, three coming close enough to punch holes in the wings and fuselage. The American plane returned fire with its Lewis guns and maneuvered it in position for a bombing run. As Carson came in, the submariners lost heart and took the boat under, disappearing just as the bombs were released. One struck precisely where the U-boat had gone down, and another right in front of it. Seconds later, the submarine shot to the surface at a steep angle, with the forward section of the boat leaping free of the water. For four minutes, it lay there at a wounded angle, until finally sliding stern force to the bottom. The French credited Carson and his crew with a victory. They were also awarded the Croix de Guerre. Airships also saw action in the course of convoy protection duties. The AT-13 was a French Astra Torre type that was given to the Americans to operate from the lighter-than-air station at Pont Beauf. On the 1st of October, 1918, she had just finished escorting one convoy to her sector and was traveling to rendezvous with another. Ahead of her, to the north and the northeast, two storms were approaching and she set course to pass between them. The big blimp carried a 45mm cannon, and while sailing between patches of weather, the crew fired on a rock projecting from the sea for practice. On the second shot, the gun's firing spring snapped, rendering the weapon useless. Armed now only with bombs, the AT-13 passed beyond the storms and sighted a suspicious vessel further north. It proved to be a submarine, and it opened fire on the airship, placing 13 rounds near her but causing no damage. Signals were sent via Aldous lamp and radio to the convoy warming them to the enemy, and the airship set off in pursuit of the retiring submarine. A strong headwind reduced the closing speed to a crawl, however, and darkness came on before it could get into bombing position. American home waters were also visited by the U-boats in force. On the morning of Sunday, July 21st, 1918, off the coast of Cape Cod, submarine U-156 surfaced in full view of bathers on the beach and opened fire on a tugboat hauling a line of barges. An HS-2 from Coast Guard Station 50 was dispatched and dropped a bomb close aboard, but this failed to explode. Another Coast Guard flyer set off after the target in another seaplane and bombed it from 500 feet. This bomb did explode, and smoke was seen to issue from the sub, which submerged after firing a few shots at the aircraft. Though these overwater missions were the huge majority of the Navy's activity in the air, they are not the whole story. Before full units of Navy airmen arrived in the war zone, some Navy pilots had gone over to fight with the Air Forces of the Allies. The first U.S. Navy ace, David Engels, for example, achieved this distinction while flying stop with camel fighters for No. 213 Squadron RAF. In the closing weeks of the war, an attempt was made to create an independent Allied strategic bombing force in France, with the initial objective of crippling the submarine bases at Zeebrugge and Ostend on the Belgian coast. This unit, called the Northern Bombing Group, was to have included several squadrons of Navy and Marine Corps aircraft. This was to be an entirely land-based force, with the Navy and Marines flying land-based bombers, both single-engine de Havilland's and huge Italian Caproni heavy bombers. Little was actually achieved by the forces that the Allies were able to assemble by the time of the armistice, however, as the effort came too late in the war to really get started. So there's where I'll end this brief account of the first decade of U.S. Navy aviation. I hope you found some of what I had to say here interesting or useful. I didn't really have a detailed knowledge of this subject when I started reading for this one, and I was kind of surprised to find out how much flying the Navy was doing in these days before American aircraft carriers. Next week we'll switch gears a bit and take a look at the 1939 German campaign against Poland. We'll look at it through the eyes of Army analysts by examining a study published by the Department of the Army in 1956, see how the experience of the Second World War and the Korean War shaped the interpretation of this battle. So I hope you'll join me for that. In the meantime, I hope this week brings you everything you hope it does. Until next time then, this is Mark Seven wishing you all the best.